about productivity. Since founding her business 20, more than 25 years ago, Tara has developed specific custom solutions that allow executives and entrepreneurs to get more done in less time. Using insight and in-depth experience, she designs and implements specific solutions tailored around the needs of each client. Her work has ranged from multi-million dollar organizations to solo premiers. Her undergraduate work is at Georgetown, and she had her master's at George Washington. So we had the same career. I did the same thing. That's great. Um, she's an active member of organizations such as Success in the City, E-Women Network, Business Networking International, and the Girl Scouts. She does workshops, teleseminars, presentations, and one-on-one -on -one consulting. And to help Terry get to know us, we're going to do, for those of you who are familiar, we're going to do what's happening here, <coughs> the lightning round of introductions, 40 plus now. So you might have seen the script in the slides, very specific and quick. Name, profession or industry, and then just three words to describe you. Who you are, kind of what brought you in today, just that, those nuggets to, to help, help, help Terry and all of us see if we might be able to help you if you're perhaps a kindred spirit that we can connect with. Uh, later on. So I'll go first. Ken Shopman, association executive, servant, leader, chameleon. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, Angelique, you're up. Angelique Cofield, quality, compliance, and risk management, frugal, clarity, and commitment. John? Uh, good morning, everyone. John Pulley, uh, Association communi Communications Ex Executive, and I'm changing my three words. Um, a strategic community connector. Right. Ron. I'm Ron Moore, Information Technology Project Manager, and I told myself I was going to prepare my three words before I got here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that. So I will say fle uh, flexible, um, tenacious, and here. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Pamela Anderson. I'm a nonprofit government professional. My three words are global, ethnic, and curious. Hello. I'm Danielle Carbono. I am, I guess, international education specialist. And my three words are educator, sustainability, and integration. Good morning, Angela Manso. My area is global government affairs, and my three words are curious, creative, and resilient. Resilient? Was that the last one? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Linda Gross, and a freelancer who has also worked in the auto industry and is also an experienced consider. My three words are frustrated but hopeful. Hi. <laughs> 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 Bonnie Ann Larkin. I'm a trade policy specialist. I can be recognized as having great integrity, grit, and frankness. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Seek, and I'm a writer editor with a public affairs background and creative, collaborative, and community. Uh, Gordon Chisholm. New business development solopreneur, strategy, execution, and passion. Gina Manley, events and operations guru. My three words are recent graduate with a job. It's hard coming after Gina. My name is John Wilhelm. I'm a financial advisor. Three words. All right, taxation, insurance, and investments. First time at this is Um Ann Morris, public policy, organized, persistent, and fun. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Ingrid Wood, um, career changer, um, used to work for uh, project management, consulting, and want to go into IT. Just completed a training program. My three words are curious, persistent, and learner. Wonderful. Hello, sir. Good morning. My name is Joseph Ashton, and I'm a scholar. My three words are courageous, educated, and a prudent aid. All right, hyphenated. Great. Hello. I'm Jeannie Rennie. I'm in editing and publications management. Uh, competent, committed, collaborative. My name is Escalina Fitzhugh. I am a policy lobbyist expert. I'm about ready to launch a commercial voiceover business. My three issues are passionate, persistent, and positive. 
I'm Laura Henderson, an international development expert, and um, my three words are global, connector, and partnership builder. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Scott. I'm a communications and strategy professional with a background in public policy. My three words are developing, curious, and communicating. Hello, sir. Hi, Steve Blakely, editor and writer, and three words are clarity of communication. Hi. Hi, uh, Boz Dewey. I've been working in the field of uh, international development in energy, sustainable energy. <coughs> Uh, possibly looking at career change. So I'd say the, the uh, things are uh, loyal, uh, tenacious, and uh, curious. Uh, good morning, Patty Garvin. Um, I am a program manager with a background in education. My three words are flexible, determined, and hopeful. Okay. Good morning, Tom Revez. Uh I'm a uh, uh, consultative technical sales and marketing specialist. And my hyphenated words are high <laughs> energy sales in metamorphosis. I <laughs> <laughs> the rules, okay. Hi, my name is Janine, and I have done uh, some paralegal work in the largest criminal trial here in Washington, D.C. And my words are honest, tenacious, and enthusiastic. Right. Thanks. Hi, Ron. I'm Ron Heffensperger. I'm a um, cybersecurity professional wannabe and uh, hopefully a uh, voice actor, uh, too. <laughs> I'm about to launch that. Uh, my three words are creative, thorough, and analytical. Hello. Hi. I'm Barbara Carey, and I am a health financial administrator, and my three words are flexible, community, and possible. Oh, I'll stand up. Too sure. small. Um, <laughs> so, uh, researcher, designer, at, sorry? Sorry, I didn't hear your name. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> Mandira Serene, researcher, designer, and fabricator. And my three words are critical analyst, uh, and innovator, and practical. Okay. Good morning. My name is Brenda. I'm an integrated marketing communications professional. My three words are strategic, collaborative, and receptive. Wonderful. Gio, I know you're hiding back there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Giovanni Capoletti. I'm happy to be back. I haven't been here in a long time. Um, I would say I'm a, a healthcare professional and writer and editor, and my three words would be uh, partner building and um, healthcare professional and um, curious. It's like six words. <laughs> <laughs> you're lucky you're you. That's okay. There you go. All right. well, thank you all so much. There it is. There it is. Oh, one more. Sure, you, sure you know how this works, right? Yeah. So, name, feeling, and three words about you. So first, thank you so much. Uh, how many of you really love Monday mornings? <laughs> oh, come on, tell the truth. How many of you are lying? <laughs> thank you, you're good. Monday morning's not my favorite time of the, of the week ever, but um, this is a great place to be on a Monday morning. Uh, time management when you're in transition. It's an interesting subject, right? Because it would seem, if you're in transition, that you've got all the time in the world. How many of you find that that's the case? <laughs> yeah, what happened to it? Where does it go? So rather than me just talking and talking for the next 30 minutes or so, this will really make a difference for you if we can have it be interactive and I can talk with you about what exactly are you facing? What are you actually dealing with? Where are you struggling with getting control of your time or Let's face it, nobody can really control time. So getting control of the actions you need to take in the time that you have. Okay, who wants to be brave enough to start? Yeah? I'm having trouble with keeping a sense of 
urgency to be productive. Oh, very good. Keeping a sense of urgency to be productive. Can anybody else relate to that? Yes? yes? Okay, good. What kinds of things have you done to uh, generate a sense of urgency for yourself? Identify the number of hours I'm going to apply for the job search during the week. Identify okay. the start, the end time. Identify targets. Okay. And, and now it's monitoring sheets. Okay, <laughs> and, and are, so you've, you identify the time you're gonna spend, you identify the targets you're gonna reach out to, and then do you do the actions? Uh-huh. <laughs> ah, that's the issue. Okay, very good. So you've got all the great plan, but it's actually then doing the outreach, right? When, when, the, time, <laughs> when the time comes. Okay, anybody else have that kind of a issue? Okay, I see a lot of nodding heads. Okay, what else? What else are you dealing with? Yes, in the back. Yes. Making that transition and being on a schedule and then having your time such that you need to plug stuff in. And you don't know what to plug in that's important. Mm -hmm. You can't sort through it. For example, um, you're getting calls uh, from people who want to hook up with you for networking. Okay. Um, you have an opportunity to T make appointments for informational interviews yes. for potential jobs and then perhaps you're working on some freelance or contractual work so you have to figure out okay what is going to be most strategic for me to uh, spend time on oh, very good. so that I am organizing my schedule effectively mm -hmm. okay and does it sometimes feel like you can't really nail anything down in your schedule because there are too many things up in the air? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. For, for me, for me, I have some, I'm in physical therapy, so mm -hmm. I've got to make sure I plug that in. How can I work around some other things? How can I get there when the metro's messed up? <laughs> you know, it's a whole lot of factors. Which that is the day that ends in Y. There are so many factors to juggle in terms of putting together this jigsaw puzzle of your schedule. Very good. Very good. Anybody else dealing with the jigsaw puzzle? Yes? Okay, what else? Well, I, if you call a jigsaw puzzle what your, um, what your obligations are or what your um, you know, responsibilities are, I'm a part-time um, caregiver for my husband. Yes. Um, and I have not learned uh, how to make that, to not make that the dominant goal as I try to launch this commercial voiceover business. It really put it on the side. So the question is prioritizing, determining, you know, this is your priority, what has to go off that to-do list, which every day is too long, right? and just to fight general distraction in the day-to-day -day, uh, kind of emergencies, particularly when you're at home versus mm -hmm. going off. <laughs> it's amazing how distracting home can be. Um, what else? What other kinds of things? Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me like life is three-dimensional that, in other words, I have my, my money goals, you know, I have my, um, my where-to-be goals, and I have my resume goals, and I have my, I have to be at the hospital goals, or which could be in Baltimore rather than DC, and how to be in multiple places, and how to sort of make an, a, a career plan while also dealing with family plans at the same time and how to not have that all just collapse on itself over over a period of looking at multiple days on a calendar mm -hmm. and sometimes it just collapses on itself because yeah. it's does. just like I can just look at Facebook instead. <laughs> I don't. I, I'm not a Facebook person, but I mean, you, you get what <laughs> I, I mean. Understand. Yes, yes. You could, you could find a way to have whatever your particular obsession is mm -hmm. be monetized. That would be like perfect. Right, <laughs> right. Because it just seems like there are it, it, things are multiple because it's more, it's more interesting to figure out what's the latest tweet 
Well, yeah. maybe, actually, I, I, I didn't get that quite right, because obviously everyone procrastinates. But what I mean is, it, it seems like I have yet to figure out a program that captures the three-dimensionalness of how to <clears throat> capture the, here's how to work out your your money, you know, how to figure out your money goals and your personal, um, you know, exercise goals and, you know, whether or not you are trying to lose weight right. in your health goals as well as your career it's goals life, yes. yeah. as yeah. well as yeah. your yeah. it's called life right yes. so it is great great and one of the things that a lot of these things have in common is you know it's dealing with where are you going to put your focus mm -hmm. in for what right and it, it can be very compelling you, you almost get the sense that you have to have real tunnel vision like I can't possibly go out and have fun when what I really need to do is focus on getting a job, mm -hmm. right? Or nobody ever has that thought, right? <laughs> <laughs> just, just come on, guys. <laughs> work with me here. Um, so I work with a lot. By the way, some of these issues, many of these issues are the same that people have when they are fully employed or overemployed or crazy, busy, exhausted, and overwhelmed, which is sort of the people that I deal with the most in my business, and I start by telling them to stop that because it doesn't work. Um, but they're always shocked when I sit down and we do an exercise where we actually design what a day should look, what a day could look like, what a week could look like, what the year could look like, and where are you going to put your focus. So part of it is establishing boundaries around certain activities, right? It's very everything expands to fill the time allowed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the only downside of you know, what you were mentioning, uh, I'm sorry, I can't read the name tag, but what you, you were mentioning about you've, you've created the plan, you know the actions you want to take, and then you don't take it, is you then spend an inordinate amount of time beating yourself up or worrying about the actions you're not taking, yes? Which is kind of, or at least I do, um, which is, Exhausting, just completely exhausting. So have you considered, first, like what are the most important activities you need to take? What are the most important actions in every area of your life, in every area that there's stuff important, with your family, with your self-care, with your exercise? I had one client, I swear to God, I worked with her for a year and a half to just get her to eat lunch. <laughs> away from her desk. I'm not kidding. It took an hour and a half. But during that hour, that, or it took a year and a half to, to get that to grooved into her calendar. But what got grooved in in the process also was she found an exercise that she really enjoyed and a group she enjoyed exercising with. And I'm very subversive. Without her realizing it, we got that early morning exercise routine completely grooved in. But I was just, as far as she was concerned, I was just trying to get her to eat lunch away from the desk. But no, we got the schedule, the exercise into the calendar as well. So you wanna first identify like three to five areas of life that are really important to you. Your family, your career, spiritual practice, giving back to community, whatever it is for you, what are those things? And then what are the most important activities that need to happen for those things to be fulfilled? This is the same thing as, like, you might choose three goals you're going to focus on. By the way, I recommend no more than two or three at a time to really focus on. And then what are the most important activities you need to do to accomplish those goals? Right? If your goal in relationship is to build a deeper relationship with your family, my family is scattered all over creation. So we have regular times when we FaceTime or we're interacting on Facebook. Thank God for Facebook. I'm the aunt that all my nieces and nephews are connected to. <laughs> <laughs> they have many aunts. I'm the only one they're all connected to. Uh, so you get to keep up with people, right? But there's scheduled time. 
I had one mentor years ago tell me he could say what we were committed to by looking at our calendar. And if we said we were committed to something, but it wasn't in our calendar, he questioned the level of commitment. At which point I realized, I said I was committed to a great relationship with my parents, and I could be pretty much relied on to talk to them every week, but that wasn't written down as an appointment with myself. Until then. And then it was written down as an appointment with myself. So that I would never get to the point of thinking, gosh, I haven't talked to mom in about a month. You know, my parents are both gone now, but it definitely made for a fun thing. I also noticed that my mother's sisters called her every week, their whole lives. But it was important. So there are those activities outside of job hunting that also need to have a place in your calendar. Yes? Yes. And you have full permission to pursue those activities with no guilt. You're not taking time away from anything you should be doing. Yes, that is air quotes. <laughs> because people spend way too much time shooting all over themselves. You're not taking time away from what you should be doing when you've designed it into your schedule. Okay? The other thing is when, um, when you are designing some of your outreach, for example, don't design a block of time more than about 90 minutes. And then give yourself a generous break. 90 minutes max. Neuroscience indicates we can't focus that long without taking a break. The best of us can only focus for that length of time before our brain just needs break. <coughs> and throwing more time at the issue does not get more done. You start to go backwards, right? So schedule 90 minutes at a time to do your activities, or even 30 minutes. I had one client, uh, Bridget Schulte, formerly of the Washington Post. Um, I worked with her, and uh, I was an expert she consulted while she was writing her book. But I'm also the one she hired to keep her sane while she was writing her book. So initially, I just had her focus for 15 minutes. Hmm. Set a timer. Do something for 15 minutes and then take a break. There's all kinds of different techniques out there. Find the rhythm that works for you. Just know that the boundary is no more than 90 minutes at a time. Okay? These will make a huge difference. Now, I also am a very, um, I call myself creatively lazy. Some people could call me a real procrastinator. Um, there's creative procrastination where you're really just sort of letting the idea marinate, right? And then there's procrastination because you either don't know what to do, what you want, what you're going to do is going to, you think it's unpleasant, or you don't know how to do it. Um, and I think, speaking of Facebook, one of the posts I put that had the most interaction, bar none, was can somebody tell me why, when I know it takes two minutes to empty my dishwasher, I actually won't get to it for four days? <laughs> or is that just me? What? We all have our flavor of that, right? <laughs> and of course, it takes two minutes to do it, but you're going to beat yourself up for four days not doing it while the dishes pile up in the sink or you're now washing them and leaving them on the side because you haven't, or you're just pulling a clean dish as you need it out of the dishwasher <laughs> until it's in fact empty and you can start over again. <laughs> um, we've all got those, so I, you have to sort of strategize with yourself. Play games with yourself. I have a whole list of rewards that I give myself for doing things I don't want to do. I'll do the thing, and then I get to pick a reward out of my little reward jar. And it may be, you know, I get to watch a TV show that I want to see. I don't have cable TV, but watch something online. Or I'm going to focus on this thing for 90 minutes, and then I'm going to take 30 minutes, and I'm going to take a walk around the block. Or I'm going to focus on this thing for 30 minutes, and then I'm going to take 15 minutes, and I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. Or I'm going to really work on this big project. I'm going to get the whole script and the slide deck done, and then I'm going to go get a massage. Mm -hmm or I'm going to go swimming, or something like that. 
right? So give yourself those little rewards and celebrate. If you say you're gonna send out five resumes or make five phone calls, then make your five phone calls and celebrate that you made your five phone calls. You know, I'm, I'm a consultant. Business development's a huge part of my job. If I don't develop new business, I don't eat. So, making phone calls is part of my everyday activity. And right now I'm working on a challenge with a bunch of people to reach out to 90 people in 30 days. Now that's three phone calls a day. I don't have to talk to 90 people in 30 days. I have to make the 90 phone calls, <laughs> right? It's great if I talk to them, but the point is to make the calls because the more you put out, it always does come back. It's not necessarily gonna come back from that direction. It may come from over here or from back here, but you have to make that outreach. And I hate making phone calls. <laughs> I'm actually an introvert. I do not like making phone calls. I don't. So I have a game. I have an appointment with myself in my calendar. It says make three phone calls. I have a list of people I'm going to call. I get my coffee. I sit down. I dial the phone. I make my three phone calls. I mark them off in my calendar that I've made them. I make a note of who did I talk to. And then I get to go do something I like to do. But it's how I make myself do that thing that I don't like to do necessarily. Now once I'm talking to people, I'm great, but making the phone call, eh, not so much. You know, and how, do you, how many creative ways can you leave this world? <laughs> but I have actually written a script for myself of what it is I wanna say, so I'm not hemming and hawing when I get the voicemail, I leave a message. And if it's somebody I'm trying to get an appointment with for an informational meeting or a capabilities briefing or something like that, I'll make the phone call, I'll leave a very specific message, I'll follow up with an email, and then I put it back in my calendar that I need to follow up again. So is anybody concerned about maybe you're bugging people by calling too often? Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay, a few people. So I think it goes a lot along with sales, right? Mm -hmm. The statistics in sales are the vast majority of sales, like 85%, are not made until the seventh to the twelfth time you've reached out. And more than 89% of salespeople will quit before the second phone call. So trust me, they're not paying that much attention to how many times you're reaching out. You are, but they're not. So keep pretty much until they tell you don't call me anymore. <laughs> Keep calling. Seriously. We are, we are incredibly important in our own world, but not so much in everybody else's. They're really not paying attention. Except I do know one guy, a business owner, who will not take a call from a salesperson until they have reached out at least seven times. Oh, and he has his assistant track it. Wow. Because then he knows they're serious. So, you know, you've lost 85% of your competition by then because they've given up. So schedule that time to do your outreach and do those key things, but then give yourself a reward. Celebrate that you did it, that's where you track it, and then give yourself a reward. Take a break, go for a walk, read a book, take a course, do something that fuels you. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so that dealt with some of it. Schedules, make yourself a schedule. It's easy for things to get away from you, especially like you said you've got primary, one of your part-time things is caregiver for your husband, yes? Boundaries around that, and then what needs to happen and who else can support you in that? You know, look for support wherever you can. And don't be afraid. I know sometimes if you either work from home or you're, you're job hunting, it seems like other people in your life have a lot of good ideas about how you ought to spend your time. <laughs> Usually helping them out, doing something they don't want to do. You don't have to do that because your job 
when you're in transition is job hunting. It is networking. It is getting out there. It is exploring opportunities, right? Not running errands for your neighbors or your friends or your siblings or your children or your spouse. It is doing what you need to do, right? And you can still have time to help them out, but you've got to put your schedule first. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Keep, what haven't I covered? What else do you want to know about? Yes. Can I ask you a quick question about the sort of structuring of the day and the activities? Is there a calendar, um, either existing or paper? Do you recommend doing paper versus online? Or is there some? Yes. There are millions yes. of them available. and. There's no one size fits all. Because, right, I mean, years ago, how many of you are familiar with the Franklin Covey planners, different, yeah. right? I used that for years. And I would buy the full thing every year, and then I would not use a whole bunch of it. I used the calendar part, because that's what I wanted. I wanted the, the month at a glance, and I wanted my two pages per day. I wanted that part. I wasn't going to do the other stuff. And for years, I made myself wrong for just, like, I'd keep these pages separate because I might get to them at some point. <laughs> no. I finally realized, no, I'm using the parts that work for me because they work for me. And I'm using them. And the rest of this doesn't work for me, but it's actually cheaper for me to buy the entire thing to get the pieces I need than to buy the individual pieces. So I would now buy the new pack when I was still using that system. I would take the pieces I want, I would put the rest of it right into recycling, and I would move on with life. There is no one size fits all. I do things like anything that's time bound, any appointments, phone calls, meetings that I have, go into my electronic calendar with reminders, alerts, so that it syncs with my phone, with my iPad, and I won't missed something, and I love the new feature where it lets you add travel time. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> since transporter technology has not yet been perfected, <laughs> travel time is important. Mm -hmm. uh, so I love that because I never, I don't bump things up against one another, and I don't know about you, but it really stresses me out <laughs> if I'm going to be late to something that's excruciatingly painful. I'm one of those people who's always early, but I always have something I can do, so I'm never wasting that amount of time. Um, so I put anything that's time bound in my electronic calendar with the alerts. I use a, either a notebook or right now I'm using a, 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 a journal type calendar where it's got my to-do list on one side and it's got room for notes on the other side. And I'll sit down every morning and I'll look at what is it I need to accomplish today. What are the three big things that I need to accomplish today? And when am I going to do them? So I'll literally schedule in when am I going to do those. And then, because I know I've won the day if I get those three things done. And if I get even one of them done, I've won the day. So I'll sit through and do that. And then I'm working. I always have a notebook next to me when I'm working because I take all my notes in it. I don't use little bits of paper or post-it notes. Everything goes into the notebook. When I finish a notebook, I put the dates on the cover and I put it in the box because I just keep everything throughout the day Everything I need, to, everything I think about, everything that comes up, just goes down into that notebook. And at the end of the day, whatever needs to be moved into action gets scheduled into action or filed into reference, but it stays in the notebook. Yes? Um, one of the things I found that helps with that is um, do bullet journaling. But yeah, I did a version of that. Yeah, and have an index in the front of the thing mm -hmm. where you can put the page, you, anything that has to do with job hunting. Yep. Gets at, the page number gets added next to it. Yep. Um, so that when you do want to go back and kind of pull things together, it, it's there. Yep. And you don't spend a lot of time. And you also don't need more than one piece, too. Exactly. You only need the one. You only need the one. And th the thing is, so the answer to your question is, there's no template. There's tons of templates out there. Go search them on Google. A lot of them are free. You can print them out and see how you like it what things you like to track and what things you want to track and what things you uh, don't need to track at all. 
I, I watched a bunch of YouTube videos on bullet journaling, and I thought, God, these are so pretty, and these people are so creative, mm -hmm. and I'm not. Black so, <laughs> mine's black and white. I know, it's like, okay, what parts of this have I been using, and am I going to adapt, and like that. So that's what I did. Yeah. Um, on the journaling piece, and I'm not sure what bullet journaling is, but yeah. I, I did read something that uh, people who journal about their job search while they're doing it tend to find a job much uh, more quickly than people who don't, so, oh. so keep journaling. Uh, <laughs> people who write things down tend to get things done. Yeah. Right. But what I want to ask you about is accountability. Um, I, uh, there's a lot of the creative people in, in here. <clears throat> and creative people aren't always the most organized people. It's always laugh. Right. I've seen see these recruitment ads that they want a highly creative, bank outside the box, conceptualizing, blah, blah, blah person who is super organized and a project manager. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, those are two different people. Okay. So you, need, you need two recruitment ads. And what I found, and so every, I've tried a lot of systems. They work for a short period of time, and then my brain is not wired to, to follow a system. But what works for me, what I found out sort of by accident, is when I do things in a group or have some group accountability, when I can bring that factor into it, which is how I'm able to exercise almost every day because I exercise with other people. About a month ago, I and the two other people decided we want, wanted to do uh, gratitude journals. We're gonna write down for five or 10 minutes every day what we're grateful for, uh, for many reasons. Uh, mostly to, to sh shift our focus from what's wrong to what's right. <laughs> and uh, because I'm doing it with these people, all we do, when we do it in a day, we just say, done. And I've missed only two days and 30 days. On my own, I probably would have been really enthusiastic for a week or 10 days, and then I probably would have stopped doing it. So accountability might work for some people. Accountability is key. Well, I want to rewind one thing you said. In my experience over 20 plus years of consulting, creative people actually are highly organized. They are not organized in a way that those of us who are more linear thinkers <laughs> recognize. However, they truly are highly organized over the, they would not be able to do what they do. It's just instead of being organized this way, they're sort of organized this way. <laughs> right? It's just, it's, and no one way is right or wrong. And when I would work with people, I would find somebody who was a true left brain analytical thinker trying to fit themselves into a creative uh, way of organizing things and then wondering why they were failing miserably. Or I would find a really right brained creative. A uh, big picture thinker trying to fit themselves into some narrowly defined analyst's version of how things needed to be organized and then wondering what was wrong with them. And it wasn't that anything was wrong with them, it was that they were trying to fit into a system that didn't work for them, which is why I say there is no one size fits all system. There really isn't, and if anybody tells you there is, or this is the perfect calendar, you should probably realize that what they're saying is it's the perfect calendar for them. Mm -hmm. It may or may not work for you. That's why you have to determine what works for you. And the only way to do that is trial and error. The one that works is the one you're going to use. That's all. So if you find yourself doing certain pieces religiously or, or regularly, that piece works for you. Don't throw it out. Just see what else you can layer in. Now, you mentioned accountability. That is key. It is absolutely key in almost anything you're trying to do, especially when you're trying to accomplish something. You have to create a structure where you can be accountable. And it's exceedingly difficult to be accountable to yourself. Because have you noticed you will let yourself off the hook? You really will. So you can't be accountable to yourself. Although, the closest you could come is creating some kind of a display where you're marking off every time you do something. And that can be an electronic display. There's, there are a couple of habit trackers available on, for smartphones. where And it, it's going to show you the percentage of time you're doing it, the percentage of time you're not. Um, you could be accountable to other people. When you're in a group like this, you know, you're, how, here's how many resumes I'm going to send out to, this week, or here's how many phone calls I'm going to make to set up an informational interview and then just report back 
accountability is not about feeling bad when you don't do it. It's about accounting for your activity with no judgment, just I said I was going to do this, I did this. I said I was going to make three phone calls today, I made three phone calls today. I said I was going to make three phone calls today, I made one phone call today. To make up for the shortfall, I'm gonna make four phone calls tomorrow. Make it up, right? If you're gonna make it up. But the point is, creating a structure for yourself where you can be accountable to someone else who's not going to be sitting in judgment. They're just listening. They're committedly listening for you taking the action you said you want to act. And it's really good if there's somebody who will also call you on your nonsense when you are repeatedly not doing what you said you're going to do. Because there's some commitment that's got a higher priority that's probably undistinguished. Like, I say I'm going to get up and exercise first thing in the morning. However, I get up at the crack of light. I'm never going to get up at the crack of dark. I don't like getting up at the crack of dark. I'm not a dark person. I get up earlier in the summertime when the crack of light is like 5.30. Uh, no, I'm never going to get up at 5.30. This just not happening. <laughs> I get up around 7.00-ish. <laughs> but it's, you know, I'm not going to be the one who's in the gym at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm not human at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm barely human at 7. And when I would do early morning networking events, I would get there 20 minutes before anybody else was expected because I needed to have coffee before I could people. <laughs> I can't people without coffee. Just can't. Yes? Yeah, you, you said that you know we should look at the different areas of our life and for each area, <laughs> pick out those things that are most important. Let's assume one of those areas, since we're all in transition, is finding a job. Right. What activities, in your experience, are going to give us the most bang for our buck? Talking to people. Mm -hmm. Talking to them, that emailing them. Talking to them. people. Just wanted to clarify. Unless you are going to be completely behind a computer screen doing something completely digital, in which case people might think you're just a bot, you're going to be talking to people on the phone, on Skype, on Zoom, on FaceTime. Face to face, it's talking to people. It's talking to everybody you know. It's mining all of your LinkedIn contacts. How many of you have contacted every single person you're connected to on LinkedIn? Good for you. Good for you. Because, well, it's, it's like Ken said. You don't know what they're doing now. You don't know who they know. It's not about the people you know. As you're going to hear at one of the other things on networking, it's not about who you know. It's about who do they know and who do they know and who do they know. Yeah? When you mentioned LinkedIn, one of the things I started doing this past weekend is just going through all my LinkedIn profiles because there are a couple of people on there who are deceased. Mm -hmm. So we clear those out first. Mm -hmm. So I'm going through just to see who's there. And if I can't remember, when I go and look at their whole lineup con connection, if I can't remember how and why I met them, I, then I have to question, maybe I need to take them off or just maybe stop getting their notifications or do something to kind of limit my interaction with them. You can certainly set up ways to limit the notifications. Yes, definitely. Like select digest. Yeah. And I do the same thing for, I've done the same thing twice this year for Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I'm also doing it for Twitter. I was in a workshop two weeks ago where you can figure out if the person that has reached out to you is real or not by mm -hmm. using Google Images. Right. And that's how you check them out. And so I, I generally do not connect with anyone who has a very sparse um, history of tweeting or posting. I generally don't connect with them. Fair enough. Fair enough. You do have to look, but you do want to, it is talking to people. So you have to prioritize talking to people. When I was working with people who were beginning their businesses, and uh, I did this myself in my own calendar, I had this hierarchy. I was either working with clients, I was, or I was doing business development to generate clients to work with. And then business development, it was either I was networking to meet new people, 
or I was making follow-up phone calls from people that I had met, or I was scheduling meetings with the people I had done follow-up phone calls with. So if I didn't have a client to work with, I would be scheduling, I would be having meetings with information meetings with people who might want to hire me. If I didn't have information meetings scheduled, I was using that time to call people to schedule information meetings. And if I didn't have people to call, it was time to go network again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the point is I had a block of time to do that activity, and then there was the hierarchy of what got put in that block of time. So, yes. Uh, I see your hands over here too, I'll be there in a second. It occurred to me as we're talking that one of my problems is my to-do list is too long. Everybody's to-do list is too long. Because all you do is transfer, transfer, transfer. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I, I think that's, a, for me, that's an important thing. You have to know what your limitations are and only what you can get done. So that, that just something I just wanted to share. Well, I, I, time for a second, yeah. because everybody has a ridiculously long to-do list. Um, a lot of those things on the list don't need to be on your list. Um, mm -hmm. They need to get done. Right. But they don't necessarily need to get done by you. Mm -hmm. I, I, so you may want to look at what are the things that only you can do and be honest about only you can do it not you can do it faster than somebody else but only you can do it those are the things that you need to pay attention to the other things you need to find people to do them for you one way or the other or discover that they don't need to be done at all there's a lot of things that end up on our lists that are what other people think we should be doing, which does not, does not necessarily have anything to do with what we're actually going to be doing, <laughs> right? So, but look, broaden your scope to look at how can you get support in the other things that need to be done so that they're off your list, but they're still getting done, okay? And you had a question? That oh, was we, a, yeah. no, I just had that, that thought. Yeah. You can see if you had what you've done yeah. and responded. Uh, Bridget laughed one time when I told her. She had this like wicked, she gave me this wicked list of what she was going to get accomplished uh, one particular day. And on our next phone call, I just, she came to the phone call. She was, I could just tell she's sitting there like this. And I said, how long did it take you to realize you weren't going to get that done? Mm. <laughs> she said, not long. She had about 27 things on her list. And, but you know, sometimes they just have to discover for themselves that this is just not possible. I did point out that, you know, her email inbox was going to be full if she died. It was still going to be full. It was always going to be full. It was never going to stop. There's always going to be more on the list. You know, there's just always going to be more on the list. But that's why when you're thinking through your day, like what are the top three things? What are the three things? need to get done. Okay? Yes? In your experience with your clients, what's the biggest waste of time? Let me think. I will tell you the thing that they do that results in the biggest waste of time is uh, they don't turn off their email. Mm -hmm. They have their email open all day long and they have the notification set to beep or buzz or bang or pop up or whatever anytime somebody else has a stray thought. And then I work with them and I make them turn off their email and I give them a paper bag when they're hyperventilating. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do start to like. <gasps> so the point is you can sort through everything in the inbox in between five and 15 minutes and then shut it off and go about your day. Uh, Brendan Richard, the author, says that the email inbox is the perfectly organized collection of everybody else's agenda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so put your agenda first. And why a lot of experts recommend don't start your day with email is because for most people it's far too easy to have that hijack yes. your entire day. Somebody else's emergency, somebody else's thing to do. Or you just start follow, following links down a rabbit hole uh, and you surface at 4 o'clock and realize you <laughs> haven't done anything all day. Yes, Jeff? Um, you mentioned that you're an introvert. Yeah. And you, sometimes when you're trying to do things, 
as a fellow introvert, I find that I'm always curious about finding a mentor. How do you find a mentor? That's a great question. Um, I can tell you personally, the way I've found mentors is I've looked to people that I respect in my field or in other fields who are accomplishing something really great, and I ask them, who do they look to? Because I can find mentors as, you know, there, some mentors are authors whose books I've read, but people I've never met. Others I've actually been able to put myself, get myself put into a formal mentoring program. Um, but you can get mentors anywhere you look. If you're looking for somebody who's farther ahead than you are and are willing to talk to you, most people are very willing to contribute their knowledge, their expertise, their insight. But you know, there's all kinds of articles out there about how to find a great mentor. Because sometimes I'm thinking, sometimes I stumble because I'm like, I need help with a project, but I don't know how to take the next steps with the project I'm working on. Uh -huh. And I don't know who to ask you know. I'm in a couple of coaching groups or different groups where it's not unusual for, for me to go into the group and post, hey, who knows somebody who knows how to do this? Mm -hmm. And almost always somebody knows somebody or somebody in the group knows how to do it and they're available for a quick call. So that's something. Use the groups that you're part of. Community groups. Uh, LinkedIn groups. LinkedIn groups. Exactly. There are people out there who know how, or Google can be your friend. How do, yeah, how to X. And some That's of these are written all down. Do, you don't I'm need to reinvent the wheel. Right. Yeah. That's a perception also that you, um, when you're looking for a mentor, you just need one. Mm -hmm. Oh no. You oh, can have more I than wish. one. Mm -hmm. That it needs to be someone that when you were saying is further ahead, there's a perception also that that person may be older in a senior level position. A mentor can be a peer or someone slightly maybe below your age, but they have expertise. So you connect with them and they really guide you through a process. And that's what I have found through the years. I, early in my career, I realized and I read that I, as an African American female, should have at least four mentors that represented this different aspects of who I was and where I desired to go in my career. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there's not you'll outgrow mentors. You'll you'll get everything you can get from them and then you you move on. That's not bad. People outgrow consultants as well. You know, some of the clients I'm sorry, there's some current literature though that makes a big difference between need a mentor and a sponsor. Correct. Mm -hmm. Those so are two, can you two different things. Which yeah. two? The sponsor is what? A sponsor is somebody who is going to actively get on the, uh, in some cases, actively get on the phone and do those strategic introductions for you. And like, they're not just giving you great advice to develop you. They're going to take you by the hand and take you into these meetings and introduce you to people and mm -hmm. put their reputation on the line that you're going to deliver. That's the closest description I know. Yeah. So I've got a calendar system that works for me. Okay. I limit myself, like, under this, the three top um, to-do items for the day of the week. But there's the tyranny of the now. You know, like, what am I going to do today? What am I going to do this week? And I, I love your thoughts on how we, you know, and doing kind of our immediate, very concrete things, which are so much more rewarding than the longer term visioning, thinking, strategizing, add an eye to whatever you like, how to balance those out but to maintain the energy with both? Very great question. I, uh, I, so those of you who are in project management may also recognize some of this. I personally do a quarterly thinking planning day for myself where I look at what are the things that I want to accomplish in the next 90 days and what is that going to take? And I start to sketch it into my calendar. 
So I never open my calendar and have a completely empty day unless I literally designed in advance that it was a completely empty day. Yeah? So every, uh, let's say every three months, every four months, every three you, months ta you, take a, you take a review of what you've been doing. I take a review of what I've been doing and I look ahead to what I want to accomplish next. Um, but I also do a mini review once a month and once a week and, you know, even a tiny bit daily because things lay out. You know, they, they happen over time and it's a series of actions over time. When I said I took on contacting three people a day for, not, um, for 30 days, yeah, 30 work days, 90 people, I actually opened up my calendar and I scheduled when I was going to do that for the entire time. So it's already blocked in, which means that time is not available for something else, right? If something else came up that was going to conflict, my rule is I can move the appointment to make the phone calls, but I cannot delete it. It has to go someplace. And sometimes you just moving one thing causes such a cascade that you just can't even move the first, in which case you say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. So. You do the regular review of how you're doing, but I literally do a larger one once a quarter. And uh, I just did a workshop with some people in one of my mastermind groups where I had them look at their year at a glance and block in things for the entire year, like vacation, doctor's appointments, time off. I can't tell you how many people argue with me about taking time off. Um, but do all of that. And then it works backwards. You just keep working backwards into a lot of detail. So I don't wake up wondering what am I going to do today because I know the key things that I'm going to do no matter what, and they're already blocked in. And then it's what time do I have? I don't fill up every minute of every day because white space is critical. Critical for sanity. <laughs> just for sanity. I even I have a calendar app if somebody wants to book calls with me they can go to the calendar app and find a time that's open in my calendar but I had to um, uh, recently they updated the feature so now, now I can tell the app that there has to be at least this much of a buffer between appointments because I have had days where I was on the phone from 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock without a single break I mean, non-stop. That is not well planned. I did not plan that well. I did not even get lunch that day. That was only the first, that was the last time that happened, but I went, oh, this does not work. I need to put in and block. Lunch, I'm not available for a call. You know, silly things, but you do. Yes? When you're trying to set up meetings with like, what is the best way in, is like half an hour, 45 minutes an hour? Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, things on meetings. I know some people who now are only setting meetings for 20 minutes and they're not yeah, sitting down meetings. Like people up. Right. <laughs> so is this when, when you're trying to get the people together for, find a time for the meeting? No, or actually at the in, meeting. At the meeting. Uh, well, one, only invite people who actually need to be taking action out of the meeting. You don't need observers or everybody who thinks they need to be in every meeting. But you don't think it's like sometimes people need to know the information? Do a recap and send it out by email later. You have to look. There, uh, I think Stanford did a study of the cost of, they had a regular executive team meeting once a week in this one organization. And then they wanted to look to see, was this really the most productive use of time for the people in the organization? Now you would think a meeting of 12 members of an executive team, meeting once a week for one hour, you're just talking 12 people for one hour. No, you're talking the prep those 12 people do for the meeting. You're talking what all of their direct reports are doing in order to brief them for the prep that they need and everybody that the direct reports are supervising and rolling up. And it turned out that this one hour a week meeting for 12 people 
actually ate up over 300,000 hours oh of time mm -hmm. in a year. And they decided the cost of that time just really was, it was not that useful. Very few meetings are really useful, but it, it's an art to make them be useful. Don't go to a meeting if you're invited to a meeting and there's not an agenda provided in advance. No agenda, no meeting. If you've gone to a meeting and there's not action items coming out of the meeting, that was a waste of your time. Information well, only meetings can be handled a better way. Say that again. I said if you go to a meeting and there are no action items coming out of the meeting, mm -hmm. you have just wasted your time. Your time has just been wasted. More questions? Yes. Distractions and managing them. I mean, other than just stopping. So I'll give you an example. I mean, John. Um, I went to network with John, so I seek him out on LinkedIn. I send him an invitation, and whilst I'm on LinkedIn, <coughs> there pops up the box. John knows all about strategic marketing. So <coughs> like, Whoa, hang on, I need to also be doing some of that network, that, that strategic marketing. So I get distracted to your point, the rabbit hole. I've gone down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Is there any way you can sort of like, I mean, one way is screening it out completely and just turning it off and you use email as an example of that. But are there any other sort of mechanisms you can think of that would prevent those rabbit holes emerging in your day? Uh, well, sometimes you just need to let yourself go down a rabbit hole, but I would set a timer um, to pull yourself back out. Uh, distractions are a key thing. I mean, it used to be that we would be distracted once every we were going to be interrupted somehow once every like five or six minutes throughout the day. It's gotten worse. It's now once every three minutes. And it takes 23 and a half minutes to bring your focus back to what you were working on when you were distracted. Now, does anybody but me see that that math is not going to work very well? <laughs> if you're going to be distracted, interrupted every three minutes, and it's going to take you 23 minutes to bring your focus back, you're kind of messed up on the very first interruption. So that's why uh, when you're focusing on something, I'm a fan of turn off your phone, turn off your email, turn off anything that's gonna make noise and let yourself focus for the 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 45 minutes, 90 minutes you've set aside and then bring the world back in and let yourself you know, go someplace. Um, what I do when I'm presented with a distraction like that is okay, so somebody else pops up that maybe I wanna check I haven't done my research yet, so I don't know if I want to chase that rabbit hole, but I want to put a pin in it, so I'm going to write it down in my notebook as a future action item. Because I, I work on being ferociously disciplined to complete the things that I said I needed to complete, because those are the most important things for me and my business, and me and my goals. The rest of it, this might be interesting, but until I do a little more research, I don't know if it's going to be a left turn. And I'm not interested in a left turn right now. But I'll look at it. I'll schedule the time to do the research because I've got business development research scheduled into my calendar. So it's just going to go into that next spot. Okay? So sense? you actually allocate time to do all these yeah. tasks. I do. I've created a, a week template for myself for the different tasks that I have to accomplish and when in time I'm going to do them. So that I always make sure that the things that are most important to me, this is the working on the things that are important in long term, not necessarily urgent today in my face, that those things are always going to be worked on because there's time set aside to work on them. Yeah. Do you have a website? I do, timetriage.com. Time, time we can access it. Huh? We can access it. You can. You can. It's just no. It's it's about it's a little wonky with the latest update, but it's being redesigned. Have, but all the information. You there. have a lot of information that you present in your presentations on that website. I have some white papers on the website, and I'd be happy. Can I have a? I have a, a home study course that I developed that I sell on the website, but I would be uh, happy. This is. Anybody have trouble with taking keeping, keeping control of your email? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have, uh, Ken, I've got a course I've done six steps to take control of your email that I'd be happy to provide 
as a gift to uh, your people here. So this is the yeah. reminder. If you had, if you didn't register online for today, <laughs> please sign in legibly <laughs> outside so that we have your email and read it. So we'll send it to you. Right. So I'll send you the okay. link and yeah. you send it. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes. One thing I try to be aware of is when I find myself talking about as I, I should do something, just because I think, I mean, there's like so much psychology of that, that that's a red flag too. Yeah. And how do you kind of think through, you know, like your friends, your neighbors, like you should do this to get a job or doing your transition, mm -hmm. or I'm telling myself that I should sit down and churn out like 15 applications which is not a good use of my time. Yeah. But what thought process would you recommend or that you tell yourself? Or I, anytime I find myself thinking I should do mm -hmm. something X, I actually unpack it and I figure out who is it who thinks I should do that. Because it's usually some uh, societal norm or you're getting great advice from somebody who's unqualified <laughs> to give you the advice. Uh, it's free, everybody's gonna give you their opinion. Um, or, uh, so I listen to the people who are qualified to advise me in whatever it is I'm trying to accomplish. And if they say, they recommend I do X, Y, Z, then I'm most likely going to do X, Y, Z because they're qualified, they see something I don't see. If somebody, my next door neighbor says, you should do this, I, somebody I was talking to last week said, oh my God, you should do a podcast. I'm like, I do not have time for that nonsense right now, thank you. I know it would be a great idea, but I'm finishing book number two. I'm not going to be doing a podcast right now. I'm not. But it is down called, okay, what do I need to know about doing a podcast as a project for 2018? Carrie, we can we can help you with that. A colleague of ours helped us. Uh, Forty plus his first podcast is coming online this month, and, uh, cool. so we can help. She'll take care of it for you. It's just basically a phone call. Like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, See, you say what you want, <laughs> and it happens. Yes, Linda. You talked about what a rabbit hole. What exactly would you consider a rat, or what is a rabbit hole, and how does it apply to time management? Uh, it is uh, going to take everything you intend for your day and make you move it all to tomorrow because, <laughs> because you're going to get lost. You're going to, oh, this is an interesting link. Oh, that's a cool article. I need to read that. Oh, this, and you just keep following links and you get completely sidetracked and, and you wake up at like 3.30 in the afternoon and you realize, oh, holy moly, I haven't had lunch. And how did it get to be 3.30? It was 9.15. <laughs> how did it get to be 3.30? Well, you just went someplace else. Sometimes your brain wants to go on walkabout and you can let it, but I let my brain go on walkabout after I've done the things that are most important to me. I'm not a morning person. My morning routine consists of getting up and reading the paper and feeding the cat and drinking my coffee. And then the first thing I do when I get to my desk is read, look through the articles that have shown up in different digests that I read for my business, read those, save the ones I want, post the ones I want to share, and then I move on. But there's like 30 minutes set aside for reading that, and then I move on to the next thing. So I'm a fan of timers as well, because at least if I've allotted an hour and the timer goes off, it's gonna at least wake me up and it's not gonna be six hours later and I'm someplace over in, over here, <laughs> when I needed to be over here, yeah? But I will, I will sometimes just gleefully go down rabbit holes. <laughs> you never know what you're gonna find, yeah. I'm very creative and sometimes lately I'm very self-motivated but lately I've been in like a slump. I don't know if it's the season, usually it's, you know the holiday season doesn't affect me but I don't know what it is and I find myself at 
what am I supposed to be doing mm -hmm. today? And so what I noticed is that you were saying some terminology, which I wrote down, bullet journaling, um, mastermind groups, project management. So this is not habit trackers, and I'm like, mm, mm. You know, and that starts sparking something. But I know I need a template. I know I need, like, what do I call somebody so I can see what you do for a template, how you organize stuff, um, so I can see it and then start taking it from there. Well, if you're curious about bullet journals, I would go to YouTube. <laughs> I, would, I would just Google bullet journal. There's yes. 65 million little videos there from people anywhere from the very analytical black and white to the uber creative, and here's how they're organizing their brain uh, in that journal. Um, that would be one thing. The other thing is I'd ask, it's Tony Schwartz in his book, the, uh, the Way We're Working Doesn't Work, talks about energy. We all have energy. He talks about energy from the point of view of uh, physics, the capacity to do work. And energy needs to be replenished, restored. And for a human being, energy is restored through um, a physical aspect, which is taking care of the body, the mental aspect, which is being able to, just being able to focus. The emotional aspect is your capacity to maintain a positive mental attitude. And the spiritual aspect, which is knowing that what you're doing ultimately makes a difference, right? The physical aspect has four parts, which is food, movement, rest, and sleep. And you can't skimp on those, because you can know what you're doing makes a difference, you can have a positive mental attitude, you can focus, but if your body breaks down, none of that is gonna matter. You're not gonna be able to do it. So it's possible in the slump, it's just a, a rhythm in your energy where you're at a pretty particularly low energy. And look for those activities that are appropriate for when you're low, at, low energy. Don't try to do a high energy activity when you just have nothing to give, right? Replenish yourself, do something that restores you, and then go back. One of the things my clients discover, and it's always shocking to them to discover, is that the more time they take off, the more they get done. The more money they make, the more people they are able to contact, because they come back fresh. They come back restored. You have to rest, even when you are in transition. It's as important rest and play and things that energize you. And there's no one thing that energizes all of us. Things that energize my sister, I find to be torture. <laughs> Would not, she's an extrovert, I'm not, right? Things that energize one person are draining for another person. So you find, but being able to recognize your own body's rhythms and play with those rhythms and slot the work in and the activities inappropriately with the level of energy you have. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, more questions? We're just about done, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. yes. yes? Did you also schedule housekeeping tours? I scheduled my housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago, I was in a very intensive uh, leadership training program I was in the final semester of my graduate program, and I was running my first business. And I have a social life. And one of the agreements in this very intensive leadership development program was get your house clean and keep it clean. Mm -hmm. That's when I found somebody to clean my house. I'm perfectly capable of cleaning my house. It's just not gonna get done if it's left up to me. So I found somebody to clean my house. And what was very funny was somebody in that course tried to call me on it. He said, what do you mean? You found somebody to clean your house. I said, nowhere in this integrity file we are filling out did it say I had to be the one to do it. You go. And another mentor of mine early on said, consider building a life support team. And I went, oh, what's a life support team? That's an interesting idea. I said, Who's on, who are the first three people? She said, somebody to clean your house, somebody to manage your finances, somebody to run errands. And if you have children, one to four people to watch children because, you know, plan A always goes out the window. 
Um, and I went, oh, I can do that. So somebody to do my grocery shopping is Washington Screen Grocer every other week, and Peapod or Harris Teeter, they all deliver now. Oh my God, Wegmans delivers to my apartment. <sighs> not a good thing, <laughs> just not a good thing. Um, so it just I just found ways to outsource those things. This goes back to when I was telling you, all the things on the to-do list, they don't all have to be done by you. It helps to have income. <laughs> <laughs> yes, however, yes, however, however, when you allow yourself to get creative and not get limited by it takes income to do X, Y, Z, you'll find people in your neighborhood, you'll find people in your building, you'll find people in your circle who would be more than happy to do this. Peapod, most of these delivery, grocery delivery companies charge a whole $8.50 to deliver it right to your door. I'm like, I'll give you the $8.50 because for me to go grocery shopping, it's at least an hour and I make a lot more than $8.50 in an hour. So. Just look to see, you know, what if you had the time you're spending on those things that you could let somebody else do. Mm -hmm. If it's it's getting in the way of either you resting or taking the actions you need to take to find the next position, find the next position, and the, the other thing just gets moved. Put the time towards what's really important, not towards that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I heard the social entrepreneurial owner of Dog Tag Bakery in yeah. Georgetown speak, and she said, outsource everything but your soul. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. I, I just say outsource everything except those things that are your unique, that only you can do. I worked with a real estate agent during the recession, took her from 20 million to 60 million, but we, we identified three things she did. She got to develop relationships, she got to negotiate contracts, and she got to play with her children. Mm. Every other flippin' thing, we outsourced mm. to somebody else. She's very happy, Kim. Mm -hmm. Yes, last question. I got a question for you. Yes. One, one of my questions is, how do you learn how to do, one thing I, I want to do is, outsource my grocery shopping. Uh -huh. How do you learn how to do those things on pe Peapod? Peapod is giant's version. Yeah, how did you learn how to do it? I went to peapod.com and I followed instructions. <laughs> <laughs> it even saves and makes a list of the things that I like the most. Oh really? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And they only charge eight dollars. <laughs> you pay for the groceries, and then the delivery fee is like eight dollars and fifty cents. I think it was the last time I checked. Now, another thing I wanted to ask you. Yeah. I used to. I I'm good at time management. Okay. Any position I've had, I've been very effective in time management. But lately, I've noticed that. I've kind of got that problem with that lady up there getting my energy or my thinking, um, getting accomplished what I want to, what I want to accomplish, mm -hmm. not what somebody else tells me I should. Mm -hmm. Is there a book that really you like that you that's helped you in your life in managing your time? Uh, not specifically. Uh, I've read a lot because I want it, but I read more to understand different ways <coughs> people think because, as I said, for time management, what works for an analytical person is not going to work for a creative person. So I, I understand uh, that. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the best books I read years ago, and I don't even, I, you can probably find it at the library, was Time Management for Unmanageable People. Time <laughs> <laughs> Management? For Unmanageable People. Thank you. Really. So. Well, Terry, thank you so much. Please join me, Terry. We're to wrap up our presentations for this year. Please take a moment and fill out the half sheets, the evaluation forms.